No, I'm a firm Recording believer in, in progress. actually starting on time so we don't <laughs> train people to come late. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today in hybrid mode. It's a true pleasure both because of our speaker and to actually see my colleagues in the room, which is always delightful. So Jenny Bergner is a NASA Hubble postdoctoral fellow of the Sagan variety at the University of Chicago in the Department of Geophysical Sciences. She studies chemistry in protostars and protoplanetary disks. She's combined millimeter wave observations taken with ALMA. So you may remember all those maps, papers that we were discussing at journal clubs last year. Um, she was the author of one of those. But she's also done laboratory experiments and simulations, uh, studying volatiles and organics and ices and all kinds of species in disks. So she did her Bachelor of Science in Chemistry at the University of Virginia, where she did research with a renowned astrochemist, Eric Herbst. And then she moved as a graduate student in chemistry and chemical biology at Harvard, where she worked with another outstanding astrochemist, who many of you may know, Karen Oberg. So she received her PhD from Harvard in 2019, and she moved to the University of Chicago, where, amongst many others, of course, she has worked with Fred Chesla, who I had to look up was a DTM fellow here 15 years ago, which made me feel a bit old. <laughs> but um, we're delighted to have her here today to talk about volatile chemistry in planet forming disks. Jenny has said she's happy to take questions uh, during, from the room during the talk if people have them. And afterwards, of course, we'll do questions from the room and from those of you on Zoom. So take it away, Jenny. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah, pleasure. Can, can people hear OK, first of all? OK, awesome. Yeah, um, pleasure to be here. So, oh, uh oh, oh no, <laughs> I've already messed up. <laughs> okay, I can go forward. Okay, great. <laughs> so we're gonna start actually back in the 1960s when astronomers started building these enormous radio telescope dishes and pointing them to regions in space where stars are forming. And much to their surprise at the time, they started detecting organic molecules. So it was first little things like ammonia, formaldehyde, and hydrogen cyanide. And then soon they were detecting bigger, more interesting things like methanol, uh, cyanoacetylene, and acetaldehyde. So in the early 1970s, there was this flurry of review articles describing this newly discovered interstellar organic chemistry. And in these articles, the um, authors, oh no. <laughs> oh, I have two things. Okay. <laughs> um, in these articles, the authors. Um, the authors took note that a lot of these small to mid-sized organic uh, molecules that they were detecting in space are the same ingredients that are actually used in prebiotic chemistry schemes for early Earth scenarios. So this was really the beginning of some speculation that interstellar chemistry could have a meaningful connection to origins of life chemistry. So if we fast forward now 50 years to where we are today, we obviously now have a much more detailed understanding of how astrochemistry works and how uh, planet formation takes place. Um, but this basic idea remains a major motivation of astrochemistry today, which is that by studying the chemical environment that stars and planets are forming in, we can learn something about how prebiotic building blocks are delivered to new planets. So what do I mean when I say a prebiotic building block? There's uh, sort of two different end members that we can think about. So at the most basic level, we could think about prebiotic building blocks as just being the elemental ingredients that are show up across all life forms here on Earth. So for organic biochemistry, there's a small subset of elements, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, that are really fundamental to organic biochemistry. So we may simply want to understand the inventory of these raw ingredients that are incorporated into planets as they're forming. So from this perspective, we want to understand what the bulk compositions of the gas and solids that are forming planets is. So just how much of these different elements is, are present um, without much regard to the form that they're delivered in. On the other end of the spectrum, we know that there's this great wealth of chemical complexity in these star forming regions. So we may also want to understand if any of these uh, organic molecules 
can actually be delivered intact to planetary surfaces and potentially play a role in jumpstarting the organic chemistry. So from this perspective, uh, we don't expect molecules that are incorporated into the primordial planetary atmospheres to survive because planet formation is a very energetic and sometimes violent process. So if you want to deliver this chemical complexity intact, it probably has to take place through a later stage impact um, of something like a modern day asteroid or comet that was formed further out in the disk, preserved its icy material, and then um, impacted the surface of the planet at a later time. So on Earth, we don't know really which of these scenarios was responsible for origins of life. So I think it's useful to sort of keep both perspectives in mind when we're trying to think about um, planet formation chemistry. So it's also an especially exciting time to be thinking about planet formation chemistry because we know that astronomers are now discovering um, dozens of these candidates for potentially habitable exoplanets. So this is just an artist's impression of some of the nearby um, potentially habitable worlds. And uh, we're still in the very early stages of understanding the nature of these exoplanets. So right now, something is considered potentially habitable if it's likely to be rocky in composition and maintain surface liquid water. So this is a good start, but ultimately we also want to understand whether these ingredients for uh, uh, organic chemistry are also delivered to the planetary surfaces. Um, directly characterizing the inventories of these volatiles in planetary atmospheres is going to be almost impossible for at least another two decades when we have sort of next generation space telescopes. Um, so instead, we can characterize the environment that these planets are forming in to try to understand how rocky worlds might be seeded with these prebiotic ingredients. Oops. And then uh, ultimately, when we have these next generation space telescopes, this context of understanding what the, the disk chemistry is doing is going to help us to contextualize these observations and to understand how different uh, rocky worlds may obtain different volatile compositions. Okay, so how do we study planet formation chemistry? We have a number of different uh, tools at our disposal. So I'm gonna walk through this little schematic and explain some of the different perspectives we can take in trying to understand uh, this chemistry. So the first uh, important distinction is that in the star and planet forming regions that we're talking about, um, these volatile elements can either exist in the gas phase or the ice phase. Um, and this turns out to be important because the behaviors of these different phases uh, produce a very different uh, chemical outcome. So this is essentially due to the fact that in these extreme environments, you have very low temperatures and densities, meaning that there are constraints on the types of reactions that can take place. So in the gas phase, we almost exclusively have reactions between ions and neutral molecules, leading uh, to some really interesting chemistry like the buildup of these long unsaturated carbon chains, um, which are quite exotic and interesting, but less uh, useful perhaps from an origins of life or prebiotic chemistry standpoint. On the other end of the spectrum, um, we have uh, this grain surface chemistry. So um, in the cold, dense environments that we're thinking about, a lot of the times the volatiles will condense out of the gas and form these icy mantles coating small dust grains. So it's within these uh, icy mantles that you can actually get around a lot of the constraints on the chemistry that are operating in the gas phase and actually build up organic complexity. So um, as a, a note of terminology, in astrochemistry, we call something a complex organic molecule if it's about six atoms or larger. <laughs> so not really that complex from a terrestrial point of view, but still sort of uh, much more interesting complexity than we, we normally see in astronomy. Okay, so we can study the um, chemistry of these gases and ices at various stages along the star and planet formation sequence. So we know that forming planets is essentially a byproduct of forming stars like our sun. So this process begins um, in the molecular cloud. When you have some overdensity of material uh, begin to collapse in on itself, forming the protostar. And in the protostellar stage, um, the whole system is still embedded in the envelope. You may have a small disk at this point, um, but more evolution is required um, to reach the protoplanetary disk stage 
where you have this isolated flattened disk structure. And here it's uh, historically uh, considered to be the site of planet formation because the densities of solids is finally high enough that you can have productive uh, kind of sticking and accretion of solids to form sort of the first steps of, um, of uh, planet formation. And then eventually anything that isn't incorporated into the star or these uh, uh, planets or planetesimals is blown out of the system and you're just left with your planetary system. So ultimately if we want to understand planet formation chemistry, we want to understand the chemistry or the chemical environment in the protoplanetary disk where these planets are forming. Um, but at each of these stages, there's some degree of inheritance from the, early, uh, the earlier uh, evolutionary stage as well. So to understand disk chemistry, we want to study disks, but also their evolutionary precursors so that we can understand sort of the inheritance of material from the early stages through to the planet formation era. Okay, and then uh, the last sort of uh, scheme that I'll talk about is the different tools that we can use to study this planet formation chemistry. So we can use um, observations, lab experiments, and astrochemistry models in a very complementary way. Um, with telescope observations, we can get direct constraints on the abundances and distributions of molecules that we can observe. And we can also really diagnose the physical conditions of these star and planet forming regions um, that we're observing. In the lab, we can make really uh, robust measurements of uh, the microphysical and chemical processes that are uh, kind of taking place in these extreme environments using very controlled um, equipment. And then we can use astrochemistry models to make predictions for how these processes actually play out in much more complex, uh, realistic environments. Okay, so you can see that we have uh, basically a lot of different pieces of information that we can bring to this question of planet formation chemistry. And I'm gonna be using this as a guide throughout the talk where basically we'll take, um, can you see this? No, can't see the mouse, that's okay. We'll basically take one segment from each layer of this wheel depending what question we're trying to address. So you'll see how this works as we go. Okay, so as a roadmap for where we're going with the uh, science part of this talk, I'm gonna start by uh, talking about how chemical complexity can be built up in the very early stages of star formation. We'll move on then to thinking um, what of this early chemistry actually can survive the formation and evolution of the disk. And then lastly, we'll talk about whether the disk stage itself is playing any important role in reprocessing this volatile material, material as planets are assembling. Okay, so starting with this first question. Um, something that was really surprising to me when I started in this field is the fact that these complex organic molecules are actually commonly detected even in the earliest stages of star formation. So these are incredibly cold and energy poor environments and it's not actually obvious how you would have enough energy around to build up these larger, more complex molecules. So uh, because we're talking about organic chemistry, we have to consider what's going on in the ices to understand how this chemical complexity is emerging. Okay, so within these astrophysical ices, there are a variety of different microphysical processes that mediate the formation of different molecules. So there are um, processes that populate and depopulate the ice with different molecules, so accretion and desorption from the grain. Within the ice, there are, uh, you can have molecules diffusing or reacting to form new molecules. And then there are also photo processes like dissociation or photo-induced desorption um, that can also contribute in some environments. So ultimately, we need to understand how each of these different processes works in a very controlled way to, to explain sort of the overall picture of how molecules can form in different interstellar environments. And fortunately, we can actually mimic these extreme conditions in the lab to study the chemistry um, in a very kind of cold space-like condition. So this is the uh, setup that I worked on during my PhD. It's an ultra high vacuum system, so we can get um, pressures down as low as about uh, 13 orders of magnitude below atmospheric pressure and temperatures as low as 10 Kelvin. So we're really mimicking the low density cold environments that star and planet formation takes place in. So this is just a schematic showing uh, some of the uh, different tools that we use within this um, setup. 
so essentially we have the helium cryostat that's connected to a cesium iodide window. It's cooling this window down to these very low temperatures. And then we can make uh, different gas mixtures and release them uh, into the chamber through this gas inlet, forming a volatile ice on this cold window. And then we can use infrared spectroscopy to actually uh, monitor the composition of the ice phase material over the course of an experiment. Um, we have a QMS that's monitoring the background composition and the gas. And then if we need a light source, we can use something like a, a UV lamp. So that's sort of the experimental setup. And the question that was very uh, compelling to me when I was in grad school was trying to understand how uh, or what kind of ice phase pathways can actually contribute to organic complexity even in the coldest interstellar regions. So I'm just going to talk about um, one example today that we think is showing um, particular promise. And this is chemistry that involves excited state oxygen atoms. So for those of you who are not familiar with um, uh, as familiar with chemistry, essentially um, when you energetically process uh, common oxygen bearing ice molecules like CO2 or water, you naturally tend to produce um, an oxygen atom that's in an electronically excited state. So we call these O singlet D atoms. So in the uh, example where you break apart CO2 with a Lyman alpha photon, you would form CO and then one of these excited oxygen atoms. So in the gas phase, we know that these excited oxygen atoms have a very special property where they can actually insert directly into the CH bond of hydrocarbons to form an organic molecule directly from a hydrocarbon. So in the case of methane, you would insert an oxygen into one of those bonds to form methanol directly. So in the gas phase, we know that uh, this type of chemistry has no energy barrier, so it's very uh, kind of thermally accessible and you have a very favorable formation of your organic product. But in the gas phase, you actually can't stabilize that product. So it tends to fall apart into radical fragments and doesn't actually help you to build up chemical complexity. So uh, what we wanted to understand was how this type of chemistry uh, proceeds in the solid state and whether having some sort of uh, uh, matrix effect could sort of rescue this molecule from falling apart. Okay, so we had to design an experiment that would let us really kind of isolate the reactivity of these excited oxygen atoms um, uh, within an ice mixture. So what we do is we make a mixture of methane and O2 ice, and then we can irradiate it with light, but basically filter out the wavelengths that will dissociate methane. So we can selectively break apart the oxygen uh, molecules within this mixture, and then track the reactivity coming from the oxygen exclusively. So in order to understand uh, the energetics of this process, we need to model the kinetics. So what this looks like, I'm showing um, on the top, uh, the infrared spectrum over the course of an experiment where you can see the methanol growing um, in the infrared. And then this is just quantified on the bottom in a growth curve. So with this type of experimental um, measurement, we can fit a simple kinetic model that just describes the reaction rate of forming uh, your organic product. And then you plot this reaction rate constant on what's called an Arrhenius plot, um, where you plot the rate constant as a function of temperature. So the idea here is that the slope of this plot is proportional to the activation barrier of the reaction. And in the, the case of this particular experiment, um, we found that there was actually a flat temperature dependence to this chemistry. So this is telling us that there's actually no energy barrier to this reaction. And this is great news if you want to do this kind of chemistry in very cold environments. So you basically don't need a thermal energy input to activate this chemistry. So in addition to measuring the energetics of this process, we can also look at the reaction mechanisms. So trying to understand how all of the different um, products within these ice mixtures are related to one another and also derive branching ratios. So understand how much of the product is going to methanol versus other um, carbon bearing side products. So it's great that we can form methanol, but ultimately we wanna explain the formation of bigger and more interesting molecules. So the next thing to do is actually test whether this type of chemistry can uh, work with larger, more interesting hydrocarbons. So we tested it with the um, ethane, ethylene, and acetylene, the C2 hydrocarbons. And in all cases, we see that this chemistry has a barrierless component, 
and we can form this really uh, large suite of different oxygen-bearing organics through this type of chemistry. So when we look at um, these protostellar ice spectra, so these are real spectra of the ice compositions along protostellar lines of sight, we see that a lot of the ice uh, features are these oxygen-bearing organic molecules that we can explain through this type of uh, excited state oxygen atom chemistry. So it's exciting that this type of chemistry could be contributing to the production of these organics um, prior to the formation of stars. And just as an advertisement, this type of um, spectrum is gonna get considerably better in the coming months, hopefully, with James Webb. So we're gonna have a much more detailed picture of the actual ice compositions and better handles on the um, more complex uh, uh, compositions of these ices. And alongside these observations, we're gonna continue to need this type of lab work to really interpret how these different molecules are forming and how you obtain these different compositions um, in this, these cold interstellar regions. Okay, so we've talked about how we can use this type of ice chemistry experiments to understand how organic molecules are forming in these early star forming stages. And one of the reasons that this is really interesting is that the uh, compositions of planet forming materials seem to be at least partially inherited from these early stages. So one really uh, dramatic example is if you look at the organic compositions of comets compared to um, low mass protostars, we see there's almost a one-to-one -one agreement in the organic compositions, suggestive that some of this material in the comets uh, was actually inherited from these early stages of star formation. When we look at more processed bodies like uh, primitive meteorites, there are still isotopic anomalies that seem to require at least a partial inheritance of interstellar material to explain these isotopic signatures. So this brings us to sort of the next part of this talk, which is trying to understand um, of the chemistry that's happening early in the star formation sequence, how much is actually surviving the formation and evolution of the disk and could be contributing to the compositions of planetesimals um, in, in forming planetary systems. Okay, so um, in order to uh, sort of think about this inheritance picture, we wanna first uh, just broadly question whether an inheritance framework is plausible. So if you think about the structure of a protoplanetary disk, um, we basically have a very steep temperature gradient in the vertical direction and this is because the surface of the disk is being heavily bombarded with radiation from the central star. So the surface layers of the disk are very hot and irradiated, and then as you move deeper into the disk, it becomes cold and shielded from radiation. So in principle, if you can incorporate these interstellar ices into the midplane of the disk, they should be pretty well protected from reprocessing because uh, the midplane is cold and, uh, and not very irradiated. So this is a nice picture, but we also know that disks are very dynamic objects. So we have processes like vertical mixing, uh, vertical settling, and radial drift, which are constantly redistributing material through the different zones of the disk. So starting my postdoc, the question that I wanted to address is, given that we know that disks are dynamic, um, should interstellar ices actually be able to survive their journey through the disk? So we're gonna pivot to using models of ice phase chemistry and disks to answer this question. All right, so um, basically we set up a new uh, simulation framework to allow us to address this inheritance question. We take a physical model that describes the movement of individual dust grains through the disk. So it considers particles being subject to dynamical effects like heat, turbulent mixing, uh, vertical settling, and radial drift. And this is just an example showing an individual grain initialized in the midplane, and you can see over the course of a million years, it's wandering through these different regions of the disk, and it's being exposed to these different uh, temperatures and UV fields as it, uh, as it goes. So then we couple this with an ice model that basically tries to mimic the structure and composition of an ice as it would be inherited from the interstellar medium. So you take uh, this consists basically of a thick, uh, water-rich layer of the ice that has a thinner CO-rich layer on top of it. And then we take this protostellar ice model and we subject it to different destructive processes. So this includes uh, thermal desorption, uh, photodesorption, 
and photo dissociation. And then we can follow these individual dust grains as they're moving through the disk and track how much ice is surviving as the particles are exposed to different physical environments. Okay, so I'm gonna show some examples of how these uh, simulations play out. This here is a micron sized grain initialized at 20 AU. And what you're gonna be looking at is on the left panel, the sort of uh, radius versus elevation in the disk, um, where the particle is moving. The next panel will show you the UV flux that the particle is being exposed to. And then the right two panels are showing the thickness of water and CO on the grains um, as they're being exposed to these uh, different environments. So this particle starts its life in the midplane of the disk. Nothing really is happening for a while. But then at some point it wanders into this very UV exposed region of the disk. And you have these big pulses of UV exposure that uh, correspond to these big uh, reprocessing events in the ices. So you first have a big photo dissociation event and then a big photo desorption event. And then at the end of the simulation, there's basically no ice left on this particle. Um, in contrast, a particle initialized at 150 AU, <clears throat> again, begins its life in the midplane of the disk. Um, but in this case, uh, it's wandering further away from the midplane. Uh, the UV field is actually uh, a bit gentler in the outer disk. And so you see a more kind of gradual exposure to UV and then a more uh, kind of gentle processing of the ices. So at the end of uh, 100,000 years, this particular grain does still have quite a bit of ice left on it. So the takeaway here is that when you couple physics and chemistry in this way, we see very different ice loss outcomes for these different grains. And this is largely uh, controlled by how efficiently the different grains can be mixed into the UV exposed layers of the disk. Okay, so here's a, a little schematic showing the different physical trajectories for the particle models that we ran, where we basically are looking at um, uh, particles initialized further out in the disk going left to right, and then the grain sizes become, uh, go from smaller to larger as we go from top to bottom. And so the, the takeaways that I want you to notice here is that um, as we move further out in the disk, the particles can be lofted further away from the midplane, um, but the UV field is also gentler in the outer disk. So like we just saw, the processing will be a little bit less destructive compared to the inner disk. When we look at different grain sizes, we see that as particles grow in size, they're more confined to the midplane of the disk, but they also become subject to radial drift at some point. So by the time you reach a millimeter in size, these particles should be pretty efficiently spiraling inwards towards the star. So with thousands of these individual particle trajectories, we can start to assemble some statistics for how ice loss should be proceeding in a dynamical disk context. Okay, so here is a summary plot for the, the ice model part of this. So we're looking at in the x-axis at the radius in the disk where these particles were initialized. The y-axis is showing you the fraction of the original ice mantle that's left intact after 100,000 years. And the different colors are showing the different grain sizes that we tested. So what you'll notice is that the small grains, one in 10 micron grains, are actually really efficiently losing their ice mantles in the comet forming regions of the disk, which is interior to about 30 AU. So these small particles are really efficiently lofted into the uh, upper layers of the disk and can't actually hold on to their ices for very long. Larger grains are not really experiencing ice loss efficiently on the timescales of the, these simulations. They're very well confined to the midplane, and so they are much better at holding on to their ices. So the takeaway here is that um, it's actually difficult to explain inheritance in comets if they're forming through the hierarchical assembly of local material. So you can't really start with interstellar sized grains and grow them to cometary sizes while preserving the ices intact. Instead, what we think is a more plausible pathway to explain the inheritance signatures is to grow small grains to larger grains further out in the disk and then drift them inwards to the comet forming region. So if your particles are growing in the outer disk, they might lose 10 or 20% of their original ice reservoir, but then they'll grow in size. And once they become pebbles, they'll drift inwards towards the star, bringing this uh, pristine interstellar material with them. 
So this framework of pebble drift and pebble accretion is uh, gaining steam across the planet formation community as a way to explain um, efficient planet formation. And I think it's really nice that here we have sort of a totally independent um, uh, way of inferring that a similar physics was at play in these primitive icy bodies based on their chemical signatures. Um, I think this is also really nice because by providing an actual plausible scenario for how this inheritance might be taking place, uh, we're sort of solidifying the link between interstellar chemistry and a potential delivery of this material to planetary surfaces uh, via impacts. Okay, so that then brings us to the last uh, question of this talk, which is trying to understand um, whether this material is being reprocessed in the disk and what sort of the, the role of the disk is in ultimately setting the composition of these uh, volatile planet forming materials. Okay, so here we're gonna pivot to using gas phase observations of protoplanetary disks. It's a very exciting time to be doing uh, disk chemistry observations, thanks in large part to ALMA. So, um, it sounds like you guys have discussed ALMA a little bit, <laughs> but for those who are unfamiliar, it's an uh, interferometer in Chile that's giving us um, exquisite spatial resolution and sensitivity for doing this kinds of uh, disk chemistry observations. So what we're looking at here is the same uh, molecular line image towards the same disk with the SMA, uh, with ALMA operating at sort of moderate capabilities, and then ALMA operating at its full potential. And you can just see how much detail we can pick out in the distribution of molecules within disks now. So both the sensitivity and the spatial resolution is really allowing us to understand disk chemistry in, in a new way. Okay, so in my very biased opinion, one of the most exciting things to come out of the early days of ALMA was the first detections of these complex molecules in a protoplanetary disk. So methyl cyanide was detected in 2015, uh, followed a year later by methanol. Um, but we still have a pretty rudimentary picture of the organic chemistry in protoplanetary disks. So we wanna understand, are these complex species common or rare in disks? Are they inherited from early stages of star formation or formed in situ? And are they important or minor species as far as the total volatile budget goes? So to answer some of these questions, we set out to survey um, six disks looking for two of these complex nitrile bearing molecules in protoplanetary disks. Uh, methyl cyanide we detected firmly in three of the six disks in our sample with two tentative detections sort of there and there as well. Um, and cyanoacetylene we detected firmly in five of the six disks in our sample. So I think it's exciting that now that we actually have the sensitivity to go looking for these bigger, more complex molecules, we're finding that they're actually quite common in protoplanetary disks. Um, so we can, we can do more, we can actually quantify how important these nitrile bearing organics are as sort of uh, carriers of the nitrile bond um, in the disk. So to do this, we do an abundance retrieval. We take a physical model of the disk that describes the temperature and density as a function of position, and then we can fit a simple uh, radial abundance profile um, to the disk. So we end up having some synthetic um, emission profiles that we can fit to our observations, and we can pull out then these radial abundance profiles uh, that look like this. So what you're seeing is on the x-axis, the radius of the disk. On the y-axis, we're looking at the abundance of the two complex nitriles relative to the simple nitrile, HCN. And what you'll see is in the inner 100 AU of these disks, methyl cyanide accounts for between one and 10% of the HCN, or with respect to HCN, and cyanoacetylene is actually as abundant as HCN in parts of this disk. So the takeaway here is that these complex nitriles are actually relatively important carriers of the nitrile bond. And in other words, if we wanna understand sort of the full picture of volatile chemistry in protoplanetary disks, we have to be paying attention to the complex molecules as well as the simple ones. Okay, so we can now compare how this uh, protoplanetary disk chemistry compares to earlier stages of star formation. So here I'm showing the methyl cyanide to methanol ratio, where methanol is just the oxygen bearing analog of methyl cyanide. And in the three disks where we either have a detection of both molecules or constraining upper limits, we see that the abundance ratio is about unity. 
When we look at the abundance ratio in the previous evolutionary stages, we're looking at a one to two order of magnitude jump in the methyl cyanide to methanol ratio over actually a very short period of time. So the nitrogen organic chemistry in protoplanetary disks seems to be strongly enhanced um, relative to, to earlier stages of star formation. Okay, so there's a pretty compelling framework to explain uh, what we're seeing. And it basically has to do with how the physical evolution of disks is coupled to the chemical evolution. So the idea is in a young disk, you have small particles that are sort of distributed throughout the extent of the disk, and these small grains have ices on them. So as the grains grow, they settle to the midplane, and they bring these icy reservoirs with them. And this leads you to actually sequester a lot of the icy material in the midplane. So you end up with a midplane that's very rich in things like water ice, and then the atmosphere of the disk is left uh, depleted in gas phase oxygen. So the net effect is that oxygen is sequestered in the midplane as a result of grain evolution. So a, a prediction from chemical models is that when you pull oxygen out of the gas, you should promote a reducing chemistry. In other words, you should be producing a lot of molecules like nitriles and hydrocarbons in this disk gas. So this can nicely sort of qualitatively explain why we see this really anomalously bright emission from molecules like methyl cyanide in protoplanetary disks. Um, but until recently, there, there haven't been many sort of tests of whether this oxygen depletion gas framework can really systematically explain the emission of nitriles and hydrocarbons in disks. So we set out to test this using a more statistical survey. So we looked at hydrocarbon, nitrile, and oxygen-bearing molecules in a sample of 14 protoplanetary disks. Uh, which for our field is actually considered a big sample. <laughs> Depends uh, what your reference point is. Um, and so here I'm just showing a gallery of some of the molecules that we image towards the subset of the disks in our sample. So C2H is our hydrocarbon, HCN is our nitrile, and then CO is our oxygen carrier. Um, and you can see sort of off the bat that there's really sort of a beautiful um, amount of diversity in the chemical emission patterns of these disks. So whether you're looking at uh, the same molecule uh, imaged in different disks or different molecules imaged in the same disk, you can see that the uh, chemical distributions are quite variable. And this speaks to the fact that you have a different chemistry playing out in the different physical environments of these different systems. So with this data set, we were able to obtain the C2H and HCN abundances for these, uh, this disk sample. And we actually found that C2H and HCN are positively correlated in the disks. So disks that are more abundant in C2H are also more abundant in HCN. And this is really a signature of a shared formation chemistry. So this nicely fits with this oxygen uh, depletion framework where <clears throat> in disks where oxygen has been removed from the gas, you should simultaneously drive the production of both hydrocarbons and nitriles. So I think it's nice that we're entering an era where we can actually use these bigger, more statistical samples to start testing the mechanisms of this disk chemistry. Okay, so a step back for um, one of the reasons why nitriles are so interesting to us from a disk chemistry perspective is that they actually seem to be really key ingredients in a lot of prebiotic chemistry schemes. So this is just one example, but they show up everywhere. Essentially, uh, hydrogen cyanide is sort of sitting at the center of this scheme that can produce things like RNA, uh, lipid, and protein precursors. So then it's quite interesting that the oxygen-poor gas in protoplanetary disks seems to be actually uniquely efficient at producing these nitrile-bearing molecules relative to earlier stages of star formation. So you may have sort of an especially efficient production of these prebiotically useful molecules alongside the, the formation of planets and planetesimals. Okay, so as sort of a glimpse of where these disk chemistry observations are going, um, you mentioned maps. This is just some, uh, some work coming out of the MAPS collaboration. So MAPS imaged five protoplanetary disks with the highest spatial resolution that ALMA can achieve. Um, and as part of the MAPS collaboration, I was working with the simple nitriles uh, CN and HCN towards these disks. So CN is shown on the top, HCN is shown in the bottom. You can see, again, a really nice kind of interesting diversity of features and morphologies in these disks. And we can use this data to try to understand 
how the nitrile chemistry is varying across these disks, and also to try to understand the mechanisms of what's producing uh, the different nitrile carriers. Okay, so as an example of what this high resolution data can do for us, here I'm showing uh, the CN to HCN ratio as a function of radius in the disk. Um, and this allows us to really see the, the radial variations in how these uh, nitriles are being produced that wasn't really possible with previous lower resolution observations. Okay, so you'll notice some trends here. Um, first of all, the sort of most notable thing I think is that the CN to HCN ratio in all five disks increases from the inner disk to the outer disk by one to two orders of magnitude. So there's a big change in the CN to HCN abundance ratio radially within each of these disks. So this actually is a feature that was predicted for a long time. Um, the idea is that in a protoplanetary disk, as you get further from the star, the dust density decreases, and so UV should actually be able to penetrate closer to the midplane as you move further out in the disk. Now, if you consider CN and HCN, um, HCN is not stable to UV. When it uh, uh, observes a photon, it tends to break apart and actually produce CN. And CN is UV stable. It doesn't really care if there's UV around. So if you imagine some small, uh, small nitrile population in your disk, uh, you would expect to preferentially uh, produce CN in the outer disk that has more UV exposure and to have more HCN in the inner disk where it's uh, more shielded from UV. So this is actually uh, quite consistent with what we're seeing now observationally, that the uh, CN is relatively more abundant in the outer disk, telling us that UV photochemistry is probably driving the production of nitriles in the gas phase. Okay, so in addition to these large scale trends, we also see some sort of small scale features. These are also really interesting to try to understand uh, what they're telling us. So in some cases, we can make a really nice story. So for instance, this disk here, MWC480, you see that the uh, positions of the, um, the, the bumps and gaps in the, C or sorry, the, uh, yeah, I guess, peaks and troughs in the CN to HCN ratio correspond almost exactly with the positions of gaps and rings in the millimeter dust disk. So this is exactly what we'd expect uh, from what I was just saying, that in the presence of um, dust gaps, you have more UV penetration, increasing the CN to HCN ratio at these gap positions. Okay, so that's a nice story, but that's actually kind of the anomaly. <laughs> so in most cases, we don't really see a universal relationship between the presence of these dust features and the CN emission features. So it seems like there is a uh, more complex interplay of physics and chemistry that's producing um, these uh, radial variations on a small scale. So just to summarize, large scale trends do imply a radially uh, dependent UV driven chemistry, but the small scale trends uh, are still difficult for us to, to interpret. Okay, so the last thing that I'm gonna talk about today um, I spent a lot of time talking about carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, and that's actually for the very practical reason that a lot of these, uh, these elements, they have carriers that are really easy to detect at all stages of star formation. So we have a pretty good understanding of the inheritance and chemistry of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur along the star and planet formation sequence. So of our main biocritical elements, Phosphorus is really the oddball. We actually have almost no astrophysical constraints on what phosphorus is doing during star and planet formation. So I'm just gonna spend a few minutes uh, talking about some work that we've been doing trying to understand phosphorus astrochemistry better. And for this, we're gonna be using observations of gas phase chemistry in protostars um, because phosphorus carriers have actually never been detected in disks. Okay, so as a little bit of big picture motivation for why phosphorus is especially interesting, there's this problem in prebiotic chemistry where a lot of the mineral forms of phosphorus are actually very insoluble in water. So this can be a bottleneck to people who are trying to understand prebiotic chemical schemes that incorporate phosphorus into the organic chemistry. So there are some um, kind of hypotheses for different carriers that are, are better sort of prebiotic ingredients and the mineral forms. Um, one option is schreibersite, which is this reduced uh, metal phase phosphorus. And then another option is to actually deliver a more volatile form of phosphorus like TO. Uh, 
So within our own solar system, we have uh, some evidence that both of these things are present. So if you look at refractory, or sorry, at primitive meteorites, we see that there's uh, a lot of refractory uh, phosphorus, uh, mainly in the form of apatite, but there is a small component of this uh, reduced phase fibrosite. And in Comet 67P, the Rosetta mission actually just detected volatile phosphorus uh, a couple years ago. So we know that there is some amount of volatile phosphorus present in the early solar system as well. So the question then is to try to use um, studies of these protosolar analogs to understand the forms and quantities that phosphorus could potentially be delivered to planets. All right, so uh, we were very excited a couple years ago, uh, made some actual serendipitous detections of the phosphorus carriers PO and PN towards the low mass protostar. And these detections were actually only the second time that any phosphorus bearing molecules had ever been detected towards a low mass or sun-like star forming region. So we're really in an era of, of data scarcity. Um, so these were single dish detections, but um, we did have some complementary observations of SIO emission towards the same source. And we see that it has this uh, really nice outflow feature coming out of the source traced by SIO. So sort of speculated that the phosphorus in the source is stored in a refractory carrier and is released into the gas within the outflow shocks um, that you see sort of co-spatial with SIO. So based on uh, this hypothesis, we actually uh, led a, a fishing expedition looking for PO and PN towards some additional low mass uh, protostars where we understand the outflow properties very well so we can try to understand sort of the energetics of what's actually releasing uh, the phosphorus into the gas. Um, and this led to three new detections of phosphorus molecules um, with the RM30 meter. So the sample is growing. We're now beginning to be able to look at some preliminary uh, demographics of the phosphorus astrochemistry and try to understand what properties of the sources and the outflows are correlated with the presence of phosphorus in, in these protostars. Um, but what's even more exciting in my opinion is uh, ALMA's uh, observations of phosphorus molecules in these sources. So this is um, the same original source B1A where we are able to map the emission of PO and PN in the source. Um, and the first thing that we wanted to understand was whether the emission is actually coming from the outflow like we suspected. So we can put up the same uh, image of SIO and we actually see that it's not a perfect overlap. So in the south, there's maybe some uh, co-spatial emission, but in the north, the phosphorus molecules are coming from adjacent to the outflow, not from within the outflow itself. So that was a puzzle. Um, we also covered a, uh, a tracer uh, CCS, which traces very dense, pristine interstellar material. And we found this uh, very kind of filamentary-like structure traced by CCS that you can see in orange. And the morphology of it suggests that the regions where phosphorus is in the gas is where the outflow is intersecting with this dense interstellar filament. So it's at these interaction regions where phosphorus is coming into the gas, suggesting that you need not just an outflow, but some shocking of this pristine interstellar material for us to see it in the gas. Uh, we can also look at other tracers. So we covered ice tracers like SO2 and methanol. And in, uh, in this case, we see that the phosphorus molecules are quite co-spatial with these ice sublimation tracers. So whatever uh, kinds of energetics are putting these ices into the gas um, are also putting the, the phosphorus molecules into the gas. So based on these patterns, we can actually try to um, make some speculation of what the grain carrier of phosphorus is. So here I'm showing a, a volatility plot where um, things are moving from uh, more refractory on the top to more volatile on the bottom. And for reference, we're looking at water and, and silicates. Okay, so we know that the parent phosphorus carrier should be more volatile than the silicate material. Otherwise, we would see it co-spatial with the SIO and not with these ice tracers. Um, we also know that the parent phosphorus carrier should be less volatile than simple ices. And the reason for this is that we've never detected phosphorus molecules towards regions like hot cores where you have thermal sublimation of ices into the gas. So it seems like you need uh, uh, more energy than just releasing uh, water. So if we think about some of the candidate uh, phosphorus carriers that could be responsible for this gas phase emission, 
We have phosphorus oxides, mineral phosphates, and metal phase phosph uh, phosphorus. And we actually rule out that metal phase phosphorus is the parent carrier because its volatility is too similar to silicates. So if that was the parent, then we would expect it to look more like SIO than like those uh, weaker shock tracers. So we speculate that uh, the, the phosphorus carrier is either some phosphorus mineral or phosphorus oxides. Um, and in general, I think this uh, avenue is really exciting that we can actually use these spatial patterns to try to understand uh, the identities of these semi-refractory grain carriers. Okay, so the last thing we wanted to do is sort of uh, try to use these observations to understand the origin of this volatile phosphorus that was detected in cometary ices. So we know that in the earliest stages of star formation, the dense cloud phase, uh, phosphorus is not present in the gas phase at all. So all of the phosphorus is hidden in a, a solid form in the early stages. So the, the volatile phosphorus that was detected in the comet is probably not sourced from the earliest stages of star formation. Um, instead, we think that the protostellar stage itself may be playing an important role in basically volatilizing some of these refractory or semi-refractory phosphorus materials, converting it to this gas phase phosphorus carrier where we detect it as PO or PN, and that this material could then recondense and be incorporated into comet forming materials, explaining the detection of this volatile phosphorus in comet 67P. Um, so consistent with this interpretation, we can look at the volatile phosphorus abundance in this protostar B1A compared to comet 67P, and uh, it seems like they're sort of to first order consistent in abundance. In both cases, the sort of total volatile phosphorus content relative to methanol um, is a few percent in both the protostar and the comet. All right, so just a summary of, of what we've talked about today started by um, describing how chemical complexity can actually be built up even in the early cold stages of star formation, and we can use lab experiments to try to understand the mechanisms that are producing this chemically complex material in ices. Then moved on to thinking about um, what of this early chemistry can survive the formation and evolution of the disk, and what is a plausible framework for explaining the inheritance of like, this icy material even in a dynamic disk context. And then lastly, we talked about the role of reprocessing within the protoplanetary disk stage and how thanks to the coupling between physical and chemical evolution, we have this very uh, reducing chemistry leading to the efficient production of molecules like nitriles and hydrocarbons in the disk compared to earlier stages of star formation. Um, so with that, I will just summarize that uh, we have all these uh, amazing different tools at our disposal for understanding this chemistry. And by putting these different pieces together, we're trying to get a more complete picture of the environment that planets are forming in. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. That was really wonderful. And we will first take questions in the room and then I think the other Alicia is gonna come in with the laptop so we can take them from Zoom. There it is. Thanks, Thanks that was great. Um, now, you said that UV chemistry is driving the formation of the nitriles, but I thought you were really saying that the UV was preferentially destroying the HCN relative to the CN. How are the molecules actually forming? Yeah, so um, it's probably kicked off by dissociating N2, so you need the really strong UV field to actually get atomic nitrogen that can then go on to react to form HCN or subsequently CN. But sort of the initial stage is, uh, is UV mediated and then the sort of balance between CN and HCN is also UV <laughs> mediated. <laughs> and I mean, you didn't mention it at all, but my understanding is, uh, you didn't mention isotopes at all, but my understanding is that the CN and HCN and comets typically have a, sometimes have a different nitrogen isotope composition, which implies a different origin. Yeah, it may be. You could also have sort of different degrees of self-shielding fractionation between CN and HCN depending like what layer right. they're in. So I don't know how that complicates the interpretation, but, but yeah. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Johanna. Thank you, this is a wonderful talk. I have lots of questions about our meeting later. Um, so just a very simple one. In, you showed kind of two samples, one from a paper from you um, in 2017 maybe, and then the MAPS results. 
And my impression was the MAPS results was a smaller um, number of disks, but higher resolution. Mm -hmm. But just across both of those samples, what was the range in disk masses? Yeah, so they're pretty massive disks. Um, a lot of the sort of first stage characterization of chemistry and disks, we pick the biggest, brightest ones because they're hard measurements to make. Um, but there's definitely a, a bias towards the more massive disks. So hopefully um, we'll get some bigger surveys that will allow us to understand the chemical variation across a more representative disk sample, but that hasn't really been done yet. Me, I'll take prerogative asking the next one. So I'm in the early phases, obviously it's interstellar UV, which can drive the uh, oxygen chemistry that you were talking about in the ices. Mm -hmm. Later in the disk, you have both the interstellar UV and the stellar UV. So I'm wondering about the balance between those and how important the evolution of the UV field is in terms of driving the chemistry in different directions. Yeah, that's a good question. So the stellar UV really dominates compared to the interstellar UV in most parts of the disk, except the very kind of outer edges of the disk. Then you can have some kind of external penetration. But for most of the disk, it seems to be the stellar UV. And I think certainly in terms of how the stellar UV is evolving, it, it probably matters, but it hasn't been looked at in a lot of detail yet. But yeah, if you have big outbursting events, for instance, <laughs> you should have um, kind of a, a peak in the, in the UV chemistry sort of following those events, so. Yeah, George. Yeah, thank you for the talk. They really enjoyed it. <coughs> um, so I had two questions. First one was my own ignorance, but when you showed the model of the uh, ice particles, you modeled them as essentially an icy core, a water icy core, and then a CO mm -hmm. rim. And I just was sort of, I'm ignorant of that, but why would, why would that be? Uh, and the second is more of an observation. Is I, I noticed you said you, you noted P4010, but mm -hmm. an oxide that's really kind of cool to me is P4006. Um, and that dials you into a complete, it's more, it's, it's less volatile than water, but it's mm -hmm. way more volatile than P4010. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. I definitely am not as familiar with the phosphorus oxide um, sort of, yeah, science. It's, well, so that's helpful to hear. Yeah, just bring up P4006. For, it's, yeah. a, it's the plus three uh, valence of phosphorus. Okay, okay. But please okay. explain the, uh, the ice sampling. Oh, yeah. So the, the idea is that the sort of first generation of interstellar ices is due to sort of atom-driven chemistry. So you have atomic um, kind of ingredients accreting onto grain surfaces, and then hydrogenation will lead to the first generation of things like water, methane, ammonia, just the simple hydrides of the most abundant elements. And then in later generations, once it's denser in the gas phase, then you begin to produce uh, CO in the gas, and then at some point, CO will freeze out sort of dramatically onto the surface of the grains. So it's just depending on sort of the evolution from more diffuse to dense um, environments that causes that transition. Mm -hmm. Okay, are there any more questions in the room? And I don't know about online if there are questions, is someone? Looking. There are no questions online. Everyone's very quiet online. It's why I like to see people here because it <laughs> seems to generate more questions. Okay. Um, there are other opportunities to talk to Jenny this afternoon. In particular, she and I are going to go grab lunch and bring it back and sit outside here and eat. So if you'd like a ride up to the little red fox to get lunch with us, you're welcome to, to nab me after the talk or you're welcome to just bring your lunch and sit with us outside Greenwald afterwards. And um, I think there are also some still some slots for dinner. I have an outdoor reservation at Leah's at Friendship Heights tonight, so it'll be warm, but it'll be outdoors, so if you're welcome to join us then. Otherwise, I think her schedule is pretty booked this afternoon, so thank you for signing up for those slots. Uh, let's thank Jenny again, because that was really a great talk. Thank you.